do this. Can you guys hear me on Zoom? On Zoom? Yeah. Cool. Um, so, uh, I, I released homework three grades. Uh, so you can take a look at that and that feedback. Um, nothing is due this week. So that's nice for you probably. Um, what else? I think that's it. Oh, I posted the slides that we're going over today as well. Any questions right off the bat before we get started? Okay, so last time we got started talking about um, task level parallelism and just a reminder of, of what this is. We've seen parallelism at the instruction level where we're doing pipelining or out of order execution or both. Uh, this allows us to be executing multiple instructions at once. Um, we've seen data parallelism, that was the last lecture slides that we went over. Um, this is SIMD. Uh, the quintessential example of this are GPUs. And now we're looking at task level parallelism. So we're looking at both multi-threading and, and multi-processing. What we care the most about in this class is the multi-processing side of things, but um, multi-threading is also uh, relevant in this area. Okay. Um, we talked also about the different types of multiprocessors. I won't go over them again. You can take a look back later. Uh, so let's just talk about the speed ups that we get from parallelism. Um, we were looking at this toy example. Again, it doesn't really make sense that you would be able to do each one of these operations on a different CPU core with no communication costs. That just, that's just not going to happen. But let's just pretend that we could. Maybe this is, you know, this can be representative of a larger um, computation that requires a bunch of components coming together. Okay, so how fast is this with uh, a single processor? Um, so with a single processor, we basically look at our abstract syntax tree. Again, each one of these operations is is one cycle. So for each node in our syntax tree, we're going to have to do an operation, which means we're going to have to take a cycle to do it. Uh, so we need to do a cycle to compute a times x or a1 times x. That's this term of our polynomial. We also compute x squared over here. Um, and then we, we multiply that into a2. So, you know, we have to evaluate the stuff you know, in, in, in an order that allows you to have all your dependencies met. But other than that, we don't have any requirements. Um, so like we couldn't, for example, compute this node until we've computed both of these two. Anyway, this comes out to 11 cycles to get to our results down here. Not sure why it's cut off on that screen. Oh. All right, now let's parallelize this across three cores. Again, it wouldn't really make sense to do multiplication and such on different cores, but we're gonna do it anyway. So now we're computing uh, uh, x squared right here, uh, a3 times x, and then we're, we're pulling in this x squared all the way across so that we get ax cubed. We are computing uh, a1 times x here, then adding to a0. And now then we, we continue with the various computations that we need to solve this problem. So notice how we can, at the top level, 
do three things at once. So we can be doing this x squared, uh, a3 times x, and a1 times x, all on different processors in our first cycle. Then we can be computing x squared times a4 over here. Um, that, that's a four, right? Yeah, that's a four. <laughs> uh, and let's see. We can be computing uh, x, uh, x squared times a3x, as well as this addition over here in the second cycle, okay? So as you can see, we're, we're able to do more work at once, but it comes to a, it, there comes a point where we can only do two operations here and then one and then one, right? So we, we kind of run out of things to do in parallel. And by the fifth cycle, we're only doing things on one core. So what we'll notice is that when, if we do the actual uh, speed up computation. So we, we, we used to take 11 cycles with our old system with only one core. Now we're taking five. Uh, this is a speed up of 2.2. And uh, if you notice, 2.2 is not three, right? So we, we lost some speed up there. And uh, it should be fairly evident where we're losing it. We're losing it in these few cycles here where we're not fully utilizing our core. Now, uh, is this a fair comparison? Do you think we could do better than 11 cycles on this one or better than five cycles on this one? So um, why is this slide here? I don't want to talk about that right now. We'll come back to that. Give me a second. Here we go. So we can't actually do better on a single core. Um, this is the abstract syntax tree evaluation for it. It looks a little bit different, but it, we, we end up with only eight nodes to get our results. Um, so we've actually improved. Oh shoot, we've actually improved our uh, our latency for the one core machine to what is what is optimal. Um, and we, now we only have a 1.6 times speed up, which is even worse. Okay. So, oh, and, and here's, here's the math. I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but you know, the idea is instead of a naive uh, translation to a, a naive abstract syntax tree, we're kind of doing uh, a bit more um, uh, 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 we're using this uh, guy's Horner's method, and it just gives you less operations. Um, so, what you can see is that, yeah, we're we're uh, we're losing even more of our speed up to to this uh, underutilization. Now, let's let's go back up here. And the question is, can we have a speed up that is actually greater than P if we have P processing elements? So if we have four cores, could we ever see a speed up that is greater than four? Um, most of the time, what we're gonna see is something like this, right? Where we increase our number of cores. So this is, uh, oh, sorry, number of cores on this axis and our speed up is on this axis. And if we had a one-to-one -one relationship where it was just two cores corresponds to two X speed up, we would be at this linear dotted line here. But typically we're gonna, we're gonna be under that, right? We're gonna underperform linear 
So we're going to have some situation where uh, maybe we're only uh, 1.9x speed up, even though we have two cores. But is there any potential that we could get up into the super linear space? There, there's maybe a hint on the slide, but any, uh, any other ideas? Any ideas why that might help? So let's think about cache effects. What if your processors happen to basically prefetch for one another into L3? So now you might end up actually seeing a speed up in your in your code, right? You 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 have one process which is doing some some computation on a bit of memory. And then your other processes require that memory as well. And because that first process had accessed it, now it's it's been pulled into your L3 cache. And you can just go and, and retrieve it from there. You don't have to go off chip. That could uh, be one reason why you might end up in the super linear space. Um, there's other reasons as well. Uh, I, I posted a article on on this on the the lecture lecture notes um, for for this lecture if you if you want to look uh, see more about it. But I just find it interesting to think about. This is kind of combining a lot of the topics that we've already discussed. Okay, where's my mouse? There we go. Okay, any questions? So far. Okay, so let's define some terms then. First term we're going to define is utilization. I've used this term already, but it's basically how much of the computing resources the processing capability are we using? Um, so effectively, we, we end up seeing this as the number of operations in the parallel version over the number of processors times time, where time is basically just a sort of a placeholder for the number of cycles, right? Um, and if we go back up to this example, we see that the utilization is going to be 11 out of 15, right? Because there's, there's five, uh, five cycles with three different processors. So that's going to be our utilization. Next term is redundancy. So this is the amount of extra work that is done with parallel processing. So what we do is we, we go ahead and take the number of operations in our parallel version and divide that by the operations in the best single processor algorithm available. So an example of why we might have extra work is for communication between threads or spawning threads. Pthread, for example, it's going to be a bit of overhead to tell the operating system, hey, I have a new thread you know, do this on a different core or something. Uh, so, so that'll be added work, extra work that we have to do in parallel process. Um, now this might, you know, if it's only uh, a, a little bit more, one or 2% more, and we get a 10X speed up or, uh, or something like this um, across our 10, 10 or 12 cores or something, then it's probably worth it. But overhead is overhead, right? Um, and fundamentally, you are technically doing more work. The last term we're going to find here is efficiency. So this is the time with one processor um, divided by processors times time with p processors. 
Okay, so um, a few things here. Efficiency will go up if the denominator gets smaller. So for the denominator to get smaller, what we will have to do is reduce the time. So if we reduce the time, that's going to improve our efficiency. But the number of processors is going to uh, increase the denominator, which reduces our efficiency. So if we say time with one processor is just like one second, but time with 20 processors is 0.5 seconds. Well, the 20 is going to really, really be pretty, pretty brutal. Our efficiency is going to be very, very low. Uh, our speed up really wasn't worth it. Uh, another formulation of this is that it's utilization over redundancy. Uh, it's sort of a calculation of, um, you know, utilization is good for efficiency, right? The more utilization you have, the more efficient you are. And redundancy is, is bad for efficiency. Uh, if it increases, um, then our total efficiency decreases. Okay, let's look at a couple of pictures to illustrate what I mean by this. So here we have a kind of a, a graph of, or a, a diagram of, the, of our processors across time. Okay. And in our parallel version, we have 10 operations. We, we can do three in the first time block, we can do three in the next, but then it goes down to two and one. And this is back to that slide that I uh, uh, was showing earlier as well. So if we calculate our utilization, we just take the number of operations divided by the number of processors, which is three and then five time units. So we get 10 over 15. Okay, so that's utilization. Let's look um, and uh, talk just a little bit about why this happens. So we've seen Amdahl's law, we've seen it chew up performance gains from cache, caching. If you have a bunch of cache messages, for example, uh, we've seen it chew up performance from branches. We've seen it chew up all of our performance and we're gonna continue to see it chew up performance because most of the time what we're going to end up with is something sublinear. Uh, we're going to end up with diminishing returns because there's fundamentally, you know, say this is the, the time, our, our parallel time, we're going to have only a fraction of our uh, program parallelizable, right? So if alpha is the parallelizable fraction of the single processor program, and then that means that one minus alpha is the non-parallelizable part, we can apply uh, Amdahl's law more or less to, to this. And, and we end up with, this is Amdahl's law for latency, I think it's the one is how we officially call it, but it's Amdahl's law. Um, so, you know, you can, for example, Optimally, you could get rid of all of all of the parallelizable part, right? You could, but you're always going to end up with with some of this non-parallelizable part. Okay, questions on on this, and then we'll talk about the next the uh, the, the other two terms briefly as well. Okay, so how much extra work do we do because of multiprocessors? This is redundancy, and uh, this is a here's a, a bit more verbose definition. It's the number of ops with p processors. Notice that there's this little little superscript best. So we're always looking for the best algorithm on both multi-core and single core. So it's we aren't like, for example. Just, just translating our single core and saying, 
oh, when we put it on multi-core, then it gives us this many operations. We want to we want to do whatever modifications we have to do to make it better for our P processors. Um, and we want to do whatever optimizations we want to do to make it better for one processor as well. So it is always guaranteed that R is going to be greater than or equal to one. The best case scenario is that it's one, right? That means that we have no redundancy. Even though we decided to parallelize, we still you know, have about the same number of instructions. But most of the time, like I said, we're going to have communication overhead. You know, even just spawning threads is going to be overhead. Um, so that's going to increase the number of ops for, for the P processors at least a little bit. Last term here is our efficiency. And again, um, uh, this is basically a, a comparison of our utilization. I, I like the utilization over redundancy uh, formulation, the, this one here. Uh, another way of, of talking about it is this, this, how much resource we use compared to how much resources we uh, can get away with. So it's kind of like uh, our, if we only need like, you know, in Colorado, you can pretty much get away with like a, a sedan or whatever. But like, if you're expensive, then you can go and get a really fancy car and an SUV and you know now you're now you can go off road nobody ever does that um, or rarely you know but everyone feels like they're going to for the two days that it's snowy enough that it matters right um, and, and this is sort of the idea right you're probably gonna be able to get away with with something something less um, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that there because I think my uh, analogies have gone off the rail. Okay, so let's remind ourselves of Amdahl's law again. Uh, we've seen this, but you know we have to always adhere to it. So let's just talk about it again. Um, if you feel like this class is just all Amdahl's law, you're not entirely incorrect. There's a lot of, you know, Amdahl's law is, is a way of of thinking more than it is just some formula, um, and we always have to be thinking about how, you know what is our what are we able to optimize and what are we not able to optimize with whatever strategy we're using okay so let's remind ourselves um the the speed up equation if we use amdahl's law is just uh, our um latency of one processor so t1 t sub one uh over t sub p our latency with p processor When doing Amdahl's law, since we're only caring about uh, this parallel speed up, we're just going to set the, the t of one to one, and then we'll, you know, we'll normalize to that, and it'll make it a little bit easier. Um, alpha is the amount of the program that we can speed up with parallelism, so we can we can basically just divide it by however many cores we have. But there's this, this other factor over here, which is one minus alpha, which is the stuff that we can't parallelize. And if we send P to infinity, we're you know, really lucky and our program's infinitely parallelizable, we can get uh, this alpha down to zero. Well, our, our limit of this speed up is gonna be one over one minus alpha. We aren't ever going to be able to touch that non-parallelizable part of our code, and this is this is the real bottleneck for parallel speedup. Um, it just eats our performance gains. Okay, well, let's look at what this does. So. If we have a 
lower alpha as we increase our um, number of processors, we're going to be limited to, to that uh, 0.9. That's going to be our upper bound to our speed up if we're you know, assuming that we can totally get rid of uh, all the other stuff, all of the parallel stuff. And as you can see, you know, uh, higher alpha is going to give us better speed up for the, the increase in processing cores. Okay. Hopefully this is fairly intuitive. Like if we if we're able to to reduce uh, or increase this, we're going to subtract more off of one, which is better because it's in the denominator and it's going to make it smaller, so our speed up is larger. So this is why like you kind of see diminishing returns when you just add more cores, right? And it's also why it's hard as a programmer to, to get your, you know, it's, it's very difficult to get your program from 90% um, parallelizable. I mean, that's a feed in and of itself up to 95% parallelizable. So this is, you know, it, it's been a long time and it, we're still trying to figure out better ways of utilizing all the cores that we have now. Because we can't pump frequency that much. So we have a bunch of cores, but we have to figure out how to utilize them in a, in a manner that is effective for the computations we want to do. The other implication of Amdahl's law, or another implication of Amdahl's law, oh shoot. Um, is, is that, uh, so this is alpha on this axis. Our benefit doesn't re, uh, of, of parallelism isn't that great until we approach one. So if like, say 10% of your program is parallelizable and you have two cores, well, you're going to get rid of 5% of your execution, but that's not going to be very much speed up, you know, 1.1 1 .1 or something. I, I don't want to do math right now in my head. So we have to really get alpha to a point where it's, you know, 80 or above to really see great performance gains, right? Um, and the other thing is that's also ignoring the fact that parallelism is going to cause overhead, communication overhead, thread spawning overhead, et cetera. So really it, it, it's below one to start, right? If we, if we parallelize across four cores and then do nothing because there's, there's no parallel code to do, that's going to just increase the overhead uh, down, down in this area. And it's only really once we get up to this higher end that we're gonna be able to like, see true, true gains in our performance. Okay, um, any questions and then we'll talk about a little bit more of Amdahl's law. Okay, so here's our Amdahl's law again. Um, here we're just saying f instead of x. So um, uh, we're dividing again by n, which is the number of processors. And the maximum speed up of any parallel program is going to be limited by the serial portion. This is our serial portion. We're doing it in series. Um, and we, we also call this the serial. serial bottleneck. And the other thing, this is another sort of way that we're going to have our performance eaten. Um, Amdahl's law eats, eats it automatically just by the fact that we can't touch this part. But even this side isn't perfect, right? We're not going to be able to divide perfectly by n. Why? Well, I've 
I've mentioned this multiple times, synchronization overhead, passing data to and fro between different processes, load imbalance. Maybe one of our cores during our parallel processing has like two things to do while another has 20. Well, the, the one that did two things is gonna be finished and underutilized um, while the other cores are, are having a hard time. And then resource sharing is also a problem. So if, if say we're writing to, to a cache line, for example, um, and all of these different cores are, are writing to the same cache line, they're gonna be invalidating each other's data all over the place. So you're gonna increase the overhead for memory accesses in that, in that situation. Even if one is just writing and all the other ones are reading, you end up with the same situation. So let's look at the sequential bottleneck. This is kind of the, the, the sort of same ideas that other less pretty graph that I showed you, but you know, as you can see, once we get up to, this is point eight, then our, our speed up, you know, it, it starts to, to climb fairly rapidly. Um, so if, the, if our parallel fraction is only, you know, 12%, uh, you know, we're gonna see barely any performance gains. And really even up to, you know, 60%, it, it's still not, not that great. We're, um, whereas once we get up to 90%, now we're, now we're able to see, for example, with this 10, 10x speed up, or um, you know, if we get it up to like 96%, now we're, we're, we're going up pretty high. So the more of your program that is parallelizable, the better is the, is the moral of this story. So why do we have these sequential bottlenecks? If we wanna, you know, one of the things that um, we talked about at the beginning of the class was, how do you go about optimizing code? Well, you target the stuff that's taking the longest and that's causing you the most problems, right? In this case, the sequential part is causing us the most problems. We can just throw money at more cores if we can parallelize stuff. But if we can't parallelize stuff, we can't throw money at more cores. So um, this is kind of a diagram of our program execution. We have some setup up here. Then we have um, five threads doing some work, but then we have to do, we have to come back to one thread Maybe it has to like pull all those threads together, do a computation, then figure out how to send out uh, some more instructions to all the all of the threads. Now, now we're able to parallelize this part, and then we have to go back to sequential. The main reason for this is our non the the the, the main reason for this is that there are some non-parallelizable operations on our data. Uh, for example, you know, this for loop looks really nice, right? It's a for loop, it's up to n. Like, we're just accessing a sub i. Oh, shoot, but, but we're also accessing a i minus one. So these aren't actually independent. Each one of these loop iterations is not independent of the other. It's dependent on the previous iteration for its values. So this can't be parallelized. So that's sad. Uh, we would have to do that in like, for example, this section here. Um, and yeah, the other, the other cause, uh, main cause is just, you know, at the beginning of your program, you're gonna have to read in some command line arguments. You aren't gonna do that in parallel. And then, you know, you, once you get in, then you can maybe spawn threads, but fundamentally you can't optimize uh, anything that you have to do to set up your thread. Um, that's just untouchable as far as your, your multiple core system. So uh, what we're going to look at now is how do we, how do we 
figure out how many cores we should actually use. So there, this is a hint. We're, we're going we're gonna to go towards this thing called asymmetry, which is where we have different cores of sort of different sizes, if you will, um, that have different amounts of capabilities, different speeds, potentially. Um, and we're going to use this because it, it'll, it'll allow us more versatility in, in our workload optimization. OK, so here, here's a picture of symmetric, where we have all of our cores the same. This one, we have 16. And asymmetric over here uh, has some cores that are the same down here, eight, eight of these cores, and then two of these sort of bigger cores, and then a, a really big core. And the problem with symmetric is that energy and performance, um, those two metrics that we talked about a long time ago, are going to be suboptimal depending on the workload, right? If you if you always have 16 processes running at the same time, doing independent stuff, you're going to be fine. Symmetric will be great. But if you ever have situations where you have you know, a real application like this, then you know, that's, that's not going to be so ideal. Asymmetric allows for more adaptability. We can send really easy tasks to the small cores or really parallelizable tasks at the smart, smaller cores. We can send our really hard tasks to the big core, stuff like that. Um, and this is, you know, we see this all over the place. The, the biggest example is the fact that we have a GPU in our computer. The GPU is this quintessential example of, you know, some, some largely parallel SIMD processor. So it's gonna be, you know, maybe a bunch of, it may be off chip, it may be on chip. For example, the M1, which is all the rave now, uh, it has on chip GPU. So, you know, I think it has eight GPU cores. So, and then it has some larger, more uh, beefy cores, if you will. And yeah, we can, we can allocate our workload accordingly. The disadvantage to this, obviously, is that this requires programmers to know what they're doing. This one over here, it's really easy. Like you just write the code. You don't have to worry about which core to put it on. Over here, you're, you, you have to figure that out. Um, if you've taken parallel programming from Bo, uh, well, you, you know all the CUDA stuff. You, have to, you actually have to like explicitly say, move this memory over to the GPU. It's really annoying. Okay, so just a just an aside, um, really quickly. You know this this idea of uh, heterogeneity, right? Is is common, right? Um, we don't have just like like all of our buildings aren't the same. Like this building is not the same. It, we, we, none of the principles, besides like having walls and support, are really the same between this building and say my house, right? This, this room is totally impractical in, a, in somebody's house, um, but it's, it's necessary in an environment like a school. Um, cars as well, like, you know, biology has lots of uh, heterogeneous like structures as well between uh, cells, organisms, et cetera. So just an aside, um, this, is, this is a technique that is, widespread and we're applying it now to computer science and computer architecture asymmetry it allows us to specialize we can have special cores that do special things um, and it sort of bridges this this gap um, between purely general purpose and purely special purpose. Most of the time, you know, we want some ability to do general purpose computing, but we also want to speed up some specific workloads. For example, you probably 
could get really, really great performance if you just implemented everything on an, F on an FPGA, which is a programmable logic board, and it'd be great. Like, it would be very special purpose though. It would do one thing and only that one thing. Um, so that would, you know, that wouldn't be so great if you wanted to then switch what you're doing on your computer. On the other hand, you're going to lose performance uh, if you if you go with a purely general purpose idea. Um, so when I talk about purely general purpose, this is just do we have the single core design um, or that that came out wrong. <laughs> we have this single type of core, and we might have multiple of them, but they're they're the same for every workload. When we have our spe special purpose stuff, now we have a single design per workload or or per metric or something. Um, so that would be uh, something like like an FPGA or a hardware decoder or something along those lines. Asymmetric gives you some um, different. Uh, types of cores so you can have different workloads that can be optimized for different subsets of problems and then you just shove them all together and call it a day okay so let's talk about some advantages and disadvantages of this asymmetry so some advantages are we can optimize multiple workloads. This is this is the real key. Um, we're able to be actually uh, we're, we're able to be more or less the same general purposeness, but we can speed up certain operations. So that's always good. Um, we can't speed up all operations, but we could speed up some. We can adapt to workload behavior. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. We can also provide um, the benefits of the special purpose. You could have a little hardware decoder for your 18K video or whatever um, craziness is coming out now. Uh, and yet you still don't need, you still have some general purpose compute power. Obviously the disadvantages are also, you know, you can't ignore them. The first one is that there's just more complexity. Computer architects have to figure this out. Programmers have to figure this out. Somebody has to verify that this works. All of this just creates complexity. There's also more overhead, both in your brain and on the program to figure out where to put all of your compute. Um, and we, you know, even if we're smart about it, we might have to switch between different contexts, um, and that's going to introduce overhead. For example, with, with CUDA, right, you have to move all your data over to your video RAM on your GPU, that's overhead. Obviously, it's, it's a lot of times worth it, but it's still overhead nonetheless. All right, um, any questions? Oh. Okay. Yeah, here, here's the GPU example. Um, obviously, uh, like even, even just like computers that have, uh, a non-dedicated GPU have some GPU on their on their processor. Uh, Intel has Iris, AMD has whatever they have, Radeon, I think. Um, so it, it's even if it's not a dedicated GPU, you're going to end up with some sort of uh, uh, heterogeneity in your in your uh, in your processor as well. And like, like I said, the M1 does all of it in the same core and happens to be somehow fast, um, which I, to me personally, it's just more of a reflection on 
Intel being total crap than Apple being actually good, but that's my opinion. Okay, so um, we we see this with uh, advantage of asymmetric processors in real world examples. For example, MySQL has a a critical section that can't be parallelized, which is is actually opening of the database table. You have to read it all into memory, and then you can do your operations in parallel. Like you, it can service thousands of requests at once, as long as it's, you know, uh, and, and do those all in parallel. But, um, you know, it, with a non asymmetric system, you would end up with some, some situation where, uh, um, uh, you know, you, you end up with some decrease in, in speed up once you get up into high numbers of cores. Whereas with asymmetric, we can, we can distribute the load a little bit better. Jake also mentioned the M1 has different performance cores. So there are some that are energy saving, some that are um, better for high performance. So this is another way, in addition to just, you know, um, uh, specialization of tasks, we can also specialize for other other metrics as well. So great point, Jake. Okay. So let's let's think about a situation where asymm asymmetry will help us. Say that we have a serialized code portion. This is, you know, either a setup portion or we've combined all of our parallel results and want to smash them together in a reduced operation, something like that. For these situations, we probably want a really big, large, powerful core, right? But once we get over to our parallel part of our program, then we want like a ton of really small cores that are wimpy, like small, maybe they're more efficient. They're also, you know, um, maybe they have less features, but it's fine. It's just in parallel, you're doing like a, a ton of them. Unfortunately, you, you can't have both in the same core. You can't have both a large and small core at once. You can have like within one single core. Um, you can have two cores, one that's small, one that's large, but we can't have one that is both simultaneously. The other thing is if we have say one huge core that's like our entire processor, then we can't have many cores. And if we have a ton of cores, and we 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 uh, are going to have less room for a, a big core. Also, one thing to note is that our small cores are going to be more energy and area efficient than our larger ones. Anybody have an idea? And by small, we we are primarily talking about performance and and uh, um, stuff like that. Any any ideas why it might be more energy efficient? to do this? And area efficient? Shorter wires? Less wires? Yeah, I mean, so there's less area on our chip that we're gonna have to power um, for our small cores. And again, we also talked about frequency. That also matters if we can if we can lower the frequency on our smaller cores. That's going to really help us uh, on the performance side because uh, frequency and power have a super linear relationship. Um, so yeah, that is that is uh, oh, and air, as far as the area goes. Um, if you have less features in your core, then you don't, you know, if you, if you get rid of your huge reorder buffer, for example, well, there you go. You just got rid of a ton of circuitry. You don't need as much space on the, on the die. So let's, 
talk about you know kind of what we're we're talking about a little bit more and let, let's talk a little bit more in depth about what we mean by large and small cores. So a large core, this one's really fancy. We have out of order execution. We have this really light, wide fetch, you know, because of branch prediction and everything. We we fetch like four instructions at once. Um, we have a huge pipeline. Um, we have a really you know aggressive hybrid branch predictor. We have tons of functional units. We have um, uh, crazy caches and you know all, all of these things. We have we have it in our big core. But each one of these features requires more transistors, more space. You know, if we have a huge reorder buffer, well, we where are we going to put that? Um, we're going to have to use more space. Small cores, on the other hand, we maybe are in order. We don't have this out of order execution, so we don't have a reorder buffer. We have a narrow fetch. We have a shallower pipeline. Maybe this one has 10, 10 stages, 14 stages. This one only has five, as an example. We have a simple branch predictor, fewer functional units. All of these contribute to it being uh, smaller, both physically and, and um, uh, kind of as far as its performance potentially as well. So, um, one problem though is that these larger cores are, are power inefficient. Even with all these fancy features, maybe we're able to get 2x performance of our small cores, which that sounds good. Um, but we're also using four times the area. And so thus also 4x power consumption as well, more or less. Okay, so so this isn't great, um, but again, we might we might want this large core occasionally, just so that you know if we have a really serial, really annoying piece of code that we just want to run as fast as possible on a single core, well maybe it's worth it to have this really crazy, fancy branch predictor, for example. Okay, so here's just another example of kind of giving you an idea of what we mean by large and small cores. Um, again, out of order, this one has a huge reorder buffer, 128 or even up to 256 entries, um, large uh, instruction fetch uh, and data fetch width. We have a huge pipeline. And um, yeah, our our performance is going to be maybe even up to five or eight times our smaller core. But we're going to use way more power, 20 to 50 times what we would on the smaller. Core. Again, maybe it's worth it to you. If this is your car and this is like, you know, obviously, okay, this is a bad example because the car is actually not too hard, like especially the ABS system or something. If you get away with a fairly small, processor but you know if you have a real real time constraint you might want this core anyway even though you're spending a lot on power um small cores are are, are the exact opposite where we're, we just make everything smaller we do less craziness with reorder buffers we have no uh, out of order execution you know stuff like this and what we what we'll see is that if we compare, for example, the, the number of uh, instructions, like energy uh, over instructions, yeah, the bigger core is better. It's four to six times better uh, as far as this, this normalized energy to a number of instructions uh, metric, but it's only four times for 20, 20 times power. Okay, so let's let's remember back to this, and hopefully by now you see that um, having one large core is not great. Having one small core is not great. Um, and 
we can't have all of them at once uh, or within a, within a single core, but we could have some large ones, some small ones, maybe some medium ones as well. And this will give us the best of both worlds. Um, let's, let's think of a sort of example here where say we have small cores, this is gonna take an area budget of one unit and performance is one, okay? And then we have some large cores, this is gonna take an area budget of four. So it'll take four times as much space on our, on our die as the one core and it has performance of two. So it's twice the performance for four times the size, okay? So we have a few different approaches. The first approach, maybe we have, uh, okay, so this is also assuming that we have um, 16 uh, units of space that we can allocate. If we go with the large pile version, we have four large cores. So each one of these is gonna give us 2x performance of a small core. And this is kind of nice because these large cores will give us high performance on a single thread for our serial uh, code section. Um, but for our for our, our parallel parts of the program, say that we have like uh, you know, eight, eight things that we can do in parallel, we're not gonna be getting as much throughput because uh, we can only do four at once. Some examples of, of this concept of having like a few, a, a small number of large cores, pretty much every CPU out there is like this. Um, you know, we, we have our Intel cores, which are, you know, eight cores. So that's still a fairly large amount of parallelism, but they're, they're really ridiculously complex, large cores. Whereas if you go over to a GPU, um, now you have a, a ton of cores and uh, they're not as fancy, but they're, they're, they're more suited to a specific uh, task. On the other hand, we could go with all small cores. Um, the advantage is obviously, if we have a really highly parallel part of our program, it's gonna be great. We can send it out across all these cores and, and, and be really happy with ourselves. The problem is, if we have a serial part of our code, it's like single threaded. Well, now we have this crappy small core that has to do the work that, you know, it would be, it's gonna be twice as slow as, as a large core. Again, examples of this are, you know, GPUs and, and the like. Um, and so the question is, can we, can we sort of mix the two? And, and the answer is yes. Let's, uh, Let's try and get the best of both worlds. Let's try and get both a, a, a large and some small units as well on the same chip. So what does this look like? Well, it looks kind of like this thing on the, on the right here. We have, instead of all small cores or all large cores, we have, um, a large number of small cores. We have we have twelve small cores, but then we also have this extra large core as well. Um, how does this help? So let's just say that we have a serial part of our uh, program. We're going to go ahead and we're we're going to put that on the large core, so it can be twice as fast. And then when we parallelize and get to the parallel part of our program. Now we can split it out across all these cores at once um, and we'll get higher throughput. A 
Okay, any questions? So let's look at um, this serial bottleneck again. Here's our little, oh, I keep shocking this, darn it. Uh, I guess that's the problem with the metal body and a crappy adapter. So here's our, our little picture again, where we're, we have some serial part of our code, some serial part of our code, and then in the middle, we have some parallel code. So up here, we're using the black core, we're using the, the beefy, nice, big, large core over here. Then once we get to the parallel part of our code, we'll splat it out across now uh, uh, six cores. So we're using all six of these cores. And then we continue in, in serial on our on our large core. If we only had small cores, we'd have to do this black thread on a small core, which means that this section here and this section here would probably be twice as slow. If we had all large cores, this would be fast, this would be fast but we could only do four at a time. So we'd be able to do four and then we'd have to still do two, uh, two more of these once they're finished on the other core. So that's not cool, right? It's back that utilization aspect that we talked about uh, a, a little while ago. So let's compare the, the different performance that, uh, that we get on these different strategies for allocating our die space. If we go with our large core uh, approach, now we have four cores, pretty good. We have our small cores um, and our serial performance is two. Our parallel throughput is going to be two times four, okay? So, you know, we're gonna be able, whatever part is our, in our parallel section, we're gonna be able to do it twice as fast because of that two X serial increase. Um, so, so we get eight for the total parallel throughput. If we go with all small, now we have um, no large cores, 16 small ones and our serial performance is one, which means that our parallel performance is just this, this one times 16. Now, if we go with a, a hybrid approach, this is where we have one large core and then only 12 small cores. But the nice thing is that our serial performance is gonna be the same as our large core system here. If we can only do it on a one thread or one core, it'll be, you know, we have a large core to do it on. So let's look at our parallel performance. So the easy part is, is computing these, these small core performances. It's just one times the number of small cores. So that's 12. Now, how do we compute the, the parallel throughput when we have this extra large core? Well, we can use this, it'll be twice as fast and we'll be able to, uh, for example, we could do two back to back of the, of, the, uh, of the parallel part of the code while the small cores are finishing. So that's why we have this one times two. So this one is the, the large core and then two is just the, the serial performance of that core. Um, any 
questions on this? So, which one's the best? Kind of, it depends, right? Um, you know, th this small core might be really nice if you have a very, very parallelizable program. Um, this might do just fine. If you have something that is able to use all four cores and doesn't need any more cores than that, this one might be fine. But if you want more flexibility, maybe sometimes you have a workflow that, that needs sort of this high parallel uh, throughput, and sometimes you need a system that has a high serial throughput, something like, uh, uh, um, like this one over here, heterogeneous model is going to be better. You still get your uh, 2x perf uh, serial performance, and you get a pretty good parallel throughput as well. Uh, you get you, you don't quite have 16, but this is 14. It's like pretty close. Um, in a multi-user system, would you rather have a tile small so overall throughput would be maximum? Potentially. Um, you know, one, one consideration for that, it, dep it depends on if you have control over the, what the users are doing. Um, if you are certain that some users are doing a particular work, workload, maybe your OS could even just give them access to, you know, a specific set of cores. So, you know, th that might be a good approach for just general purpose. Like, how do we allocate our cores, you know, in a multi-user system? Let's just let's just go with this tile small or something along those lines. That might be a good way of approaching it. But I, all of these have merits for different work workloads, and fundamentally. You know, um, every decision that we make in computer architecture, you know, while uh, there are ones that are more commonly made than others, there are some decisions that have kind of become industry standard. That doesn't mean that the other decisions aren't valid for some cases. It may just happen that we have, as an industry, have sort of decided that this case over here, we care more about it. We're gonna we're gonna focus on optimizing for it. You know, that, that's that's kind of the um, idea. And and generally, what I would say is that we actually see this hybrid approach in many multi-user systems as well. Back to your question, uh, because you have plenty of systems where you can have a, a GPU attached to your VPS, for example. So uh, in that way, we would we, we do see this. Great questions. Any any more questions? So let's talk about quantifying this. How do we apply Amdahl's law uh, when we have this asymmetric multiprocessor? First of all, we have to make some assumptions. We have to assume that the programmer is smart enough to put the serial portion on the large core. Okay. We're relying on, on that at least. The second assumption is that the parallel portion of our code can be executed on both the small cores and the large cores. Um, 
if you're talking about a, a separate CPU and GPU system, this may not necessarily be the case. You could partition your data and do some of it on the CPU and some of it on the GPU, but that, again, introduces more complexity in your brain and you know, that makes your program less maintainable. Um, but it, it is possible. Um, and if you don't have this assumption, then what we'll see is that we just have to remove one of the terms. If we can't parallelize on, for example, the large cores, we have to get rid of this X times L part of our new Amdahl's equation. Uh, and we can only use the, the number of small processors to speed up our parallel portion. So I, I kind of jumped down to this equation, but let's talk about the, the terms a bit more. F is our parallel parallelizable fraction. We also call it alpha up above. We've called it x, whatever variable. Um, just you know, mention what it means. Um, and then we have L, which is the number of large processors. And then S is the number of small ones. And then x, this is the speed up of the large processor over a smaller one. So our relative performance between a small core and a large core. In the examples that we've talked about so far, it's just been two because you know that's really easy, and any number that it is uh, a whole number is preferable because then you don't have to think as much. So um, anyway, so our speed up equation then looks like this. So before. We had we we had this one um, uh, um, minus f part, and then we had this f over s before in our Amdahl's law. Now what we're doing is that this one minus f part we're we're going to divide that by x because of the speed up from the large core. So we're we're speeding this up by a factor of x. Um, so this over x is an additional part of our equation. And then over on this side, this x times l is also additional. Um, we've added this to our parallel equation as well. OK. Any questions? So let's talk about these parallel bottlenecks real quick. Um, there can be in our parallel portions of code some serialized bits, right? Um, and so this can actually also benefit from being on a large core. For example, if we have a critical section that has a lot of contention in it, that would be a prime example to put on a larger call. Um, also, even though we've parallelized, some parallel sections may take longer than others. Um, maybe, you know, even though we've we parallelized it, some of these are, oh gosh, why is somebody, um, uh, you know, more complicated. We, you know, just have, this one happens to be a, a more complicated part of our, our parallel code. So uh, an idea that we will will look at is let's find the code portions that cause serialization and actually just move those over to the large core. Okay, that's what we'll talk about briefly at the beginning of next class and then we'll dive in to cache coherence, which is even more fun and uh, involves communication between threads about what their caches contain. So with that, you are dismissed. I will stick around for just a minute to answer any questions. Thanks.